of the first text messages I sent was that I was sorry that I'm still alive. So that's how I felt. Like I was sad that Troy died, but I also felt so overwhelmingly guilty that I was about to get on a flight and come back home and have a life and he wasn't. So I was just like, felt, yeah, really guilty. Survivor's yeah. guilt is a huge part yeah. of this kind of thing, isn't it? It's a yeah. very real thing. Yeah. And you obviously experienced that mm. hugely. How long did that, does that last for, that feeling guilty of being alive? I think I still feel a, li a little bit now. I think it's certainly, you know, I've done some, you know, great things in my life in the last 19 years. And at the beginning, I think a lot of it was driven by, I felt like I had to do something mm. extraordinary to prove to myself that it was okay that I was alive. Yeah. And I wasn't trying to prove it to anyone else because no one made, makes you feel that way. It's only you. Right. So I feel like I did a lot at the beginning out of guilt. Wow. Because I wanted to be okay with the fact that I'd survived. And I kept thinking over 300,000 people were dead and they didn't have a chance. So, which also helped me get out of bed when I didn't want to as well. Yeah. Yeah, but it also was quite debilitating when you feel, you know, you're living for all these people. And in that time, what you have done is completely mind-blowing. You came home and pretty much got started on building a school on PP Island. Yeah. The Broadbridge School. Yeah. Which is one of the most beautiful, yeah, most is. gorgeous schools. Yeah. You walk in and there's a big picture of Troy up there. And Sam and I went and visited it when we were in PP. And we walk in and we look at each other and like both burst into tears and like, don't let these kids, we're going to freak these kids out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But the fact that you and the Melbourne Football Club went yeah. over and built this in Troy's honour and from that you've done so much, you've educated yourself, you dedicate your life to helping other people. Yeah, yeah. Do you think that what you would be doing now is what you would be doing if that didn't happen? I don't know. I don't, I, I think my life is so different post the tsunami. Um, I would like to think I was still doing the same line of work, but I think it certainly has made me realise what life's really about. Because I could, you know, something could happen to me today and I want the people that are going to talk at my funeral not to talk about the stuff I've got or the awards I've got. I want them to talk about how I make them feel. Right. So for me, that's my biggest drive because I want people to stand up there and be like that I was thoughtful, that I, you know, made a positive difference in their mm. lives, even if it was so tiny to really big. So that's, for me, really important because I know that life's fragile. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I have more of an understanding of what life should be about. When you got home from everything that had happened, you basically became the face of yeah. the tsunami, yeah. you were, your story was, you lost your husband on your honeymoon, who yeah. was a Melbourne football player, Yeah. so you were thrust into the spotlight, yeah. how did you handle, you know, one day you're wearing your wedding dress to your wedding, the next time yeah. you're in Melbourne, you remodel it into a top and you're wearing it to your husband's funeral, funeral. Yeah. these things are like, you can't even script that for a movie, but you're really no. it. Yeah. so going from quite a normal life, to coming home and this all happening around you, being the spotlight. How do you, do you look back and go, maybe that helped you or was that completely? Uh, I think sometimes it gave me a purpose, but I think it put a lot of pressure on me because mm -hmm. I don't think I started grieving till the next year or maybe the year after. When things slowed, slowed down. down. Yeah. Because it was after I built the education center was when things went really downhill. And I think it was because all of a sudden life moved on for everyone else. Mm -hmm. And I was then, last week's news, like in the first year, my face was on the front of the Herald Sun over 30 times. So I was so recognizable to everyone else as the tsunami widow, basically. Yeah. And then life went on for everyone else and I had not really confronted what I dealt with. And because Troy died, I hadn't started to think about the impacts of the trauma. 
because it became about his death, not really about my survival and not about the impact of that on me. So I think that it delayed what I needed to go through. Mm. But at the same time, the media allowed me to do some amazing things over in Thailand. I was able to raise a lot of awareness, raise money. So in so many ways, it helped me to get to the outcome that I wanted to get to over there. Yeah. Right. So I, I don't feel angry at the position I was put in, but I think it definitely delayed what I needed to go through. Yeah. yeah. You're great mates with Sam Steins, and I love yeah. that she says that um, education is power. Yes. Especially for women. Yeah. I think it's so important that even if it's not doing courses, we're curious and we're questioning things. Yeah. That is who you are in a nutshell. You will go off for six months and come back and have a bloody bachelor of this or this yeah. or that. Like you, you. Yeah. I've never met anyone who has educated themselves more. Yeah. And just quietly climbs the ladder. Yeah. Because all of a sudden we get a text saying, "Oh, I'm the CEO of St Kilda Youth Services." Like, what the actual fuck? Yeah. You're 31, 32 years old, and you are a CEO. Yeah. <laughs> it's wild. It's so incredible. <laughs> yeah. How did getting, has it always been you've always wanted to, which in, again is in an industry where you're giving back these women, yeah. are sex workers, yeah. drug addicts. Yeah. And can you explain the work that you do? With yeah. Well, the thing, the thing about St Kilda Youth Services is that I, it's so interesting because eight years ago I was involved because I've lived in Elwood and I've lived around the area and I saw what they were doing and they were being at the forefront eight years ago in that they were starting alternative education for the most disadvantaged people in an area where we're all living in really nice houses and quite affluent but there's a lot of disadvantage mm. and I just remember thinking really impressed with what they were doing because I believe in education and it's how I've, it's been my mantra and I've seen change and why build an education centre in Thailand when everyone said do an orphanage. I was like, no, it's about education. Yeah. And the, the role of the CEO of St Kilda Youth Service came up last year and at the time I was starting to position myself where I thought I was ready to be a CEO, which is a strange thing to think at my age, but I'd been really pushing to get myself to that point yeah. um, because I know that I've got a lot to give as a leader and I think that I wanted to, to do it in an industry I was passionate about. And I went through a long recruitment process and I was so scared to even talk to people about it because I thought, if this doesn't happen, you sort of feel like, oh, you know, you didn't get there. And, and for me, I, a lot of things after I won Young Australian were a bit easier to get because people respect you. But that had been a few years prior and I actually had to prove that I was more than the Tsunami Widow to yeah. St Kilda Youth Service to get this job. Right. Because to be the CEO, you have to have skills yeah. to run, you know, a three million operating organisation and manage 40 staff and do all that. So you have to be able to do it. So, yeah. so the day that they said, they rang me and said to come in and told me that they wanted me to be the CEO. It was like that moment where you're like, um, I thought about it for so long. When I was in REACH, when I was 16, I wrote in my Hero's Journey book that I wanted to be a CEO. Mm. And when Troy died and when Jim died, you go, seriously, my parents were like, if you do nothing, it's totally fine. Mm. You just need to get up. Yeah. And then I was like, hang on, but I think I want to be a CEO. <laughs> like, and it just was surreal when I found out. And at first I was really overwhelmed. Like I was driving down Punt Road and I wanted, all I wanted was to tell Jim. Like that was the only thing. The first half an hour I was bawling down Punt Road and I just wanted to ring Jim and I was like, does he know? And I just kept processing that. And then I called my sister and she was like, I was like, couldn't breathe. She's like, what's happened? What's happened? I'm like, I'm a CEO. And she goes, well, isn't that good? And I was like, yes, and I go, people actually can see what I've done. People can see me. And she's like, yeah, we can. I said, but no one says anything. And she goes, yeah, we can see what you're doing. And I was like, because I think that's all I wanted as well. Yeah, to be something different than yeah. the label you would have. Yeah. yeah, and I tried so hard for people to see that I did, I wasn't just someone to feel sorry for. Like, I feel like I've got a lot more to give and I think when I got that role at St Kilda Youth Service, 
I felt like things changed for me. Like I felt mm. like finally people were seeing me for who I am and not just my story. Being a female CEO, yeah. you're in the minority oh, of yeah. the world. And yeah. you're even saying at work often people default to the men for the yes. places where yeah. you're the boss. Yeah. How do you handle that? It's it's interesting and because I'm young, I'm very like young to be a CEO as well and female, it's people usually go, oh, what, you're the CEO? And I, if someone says, what do you do? I'll say, I work at St Kilda Youth Service. And then they'll go, oh, are you a teacher there? Or are you a youth worker? And then I'll have to sort of say, oh, I'm the CEO. And they go, what? And like the reactions or, um, and then you sometimes in there, what? I doubt myself and go, oh, should I not be the CEO? You know, so you sort of, but you have to just be really confident in it. Yeah. And it feels really good because I've got um, quite a few female staff who, they can then see it's a possibility for them. Because you can't see, yeah. you can't be what you can't see. Exactly. And I love that where it's yeah. like, you're, yeah. you make other, like other young girls go, I can yeah. do that too. Yeah, and even the, the young people that access our services, they know, a lot of them know my background mm -hmm. and they then see me being the CEO and they go, well, okay, maybe I can do something like oh. that. So it's an amazing feeling knowing me being in that position can impact the other women around and that's what I like about it and you sort of in the end it's a bit funny when you walk into rooms and if I walk in with a man they'll default that that's a CEO or whatever yeah. and but it is it becomes a bit it gives me a little bit of a giggle now yeah it's sort of cool like, to say, hang on, yeah, yeah. <laughs> back here I'm the CEO so yeah this year has been a pretty incredible year for you yeah your CEO kicking ass in yeah in an amazing career and you have fallen in love yes I have with an amazing guy yeah Jake so let's talk about how you guys met uh, so Jake and I met through our networks and um, we never really crossed paths until late last year and um, I don't know what happened but it just happened. Well, you were going to be a dirty bird and go on five dates with five different guys for yes. a charity of him. And yes. like, who can we, okay, who, who can we set you up with? And then all of a sudden it was like, this guy. And then you went out on one date and then you didn't do the other five with the other four or five guys that were like... No, <laughs> well, Jake and I wrote the text messages to let them down. <laughs> I'm sure they were totally shattered. Um, you know, worst text messages I've ever received. But, uh, yeah, I... I don't know and I wasn't expecting it it just came out of absolutely nowhere and I like never believed probably that this was going to happen to me again and then I got in a really good space and then Jake came into my life and that first date I went there with no expectation and there was this one moment where we were on a date and I don't know what came up because I'm not confident in that sort of way or and I just remember grabbing his hand and it was just like this whole instinct to hold his hand and I don't know why, that, I laugh about it now because I'm like, what was I thinking on this first date doing this sort of thing? <laughs> but I just, I don't know and I just felt something, his energy, the connection with him and I hugged him, I got to feel his heart beating and I was like, I want to feel his heartbeat. And it was the most overwhelming feeling but then it was the also felt like the nicest feeling as well yeah um because i thought is there going to be fireworks when i know i'm in love with him or what's it going to feel like because i haven't been in love for such a long time well yeah. for nine ten years what's this gonna is it gonna be fireworks is someone gonna say you're in love with jake or <laughs> how's it gonna feel but it just then started just to feel really normal yeah. and he's got this amazing like energy where he balances me out quite a bit, but he's also got this really beautiful sense of self where it's like when he, when he wants something or knows something, it's just that's how it is. And yeah. I love that about him. But then he's got this really beautiful like, way of looking at life and really calming. Yeah. And I need that because yeah. I've sometimes been up and down, up and down. Um, and it's really good to have someone who's so grounded. Tell me about the first time he told you he loved you. Oh, well... He was like, oh, there's something that... You have hilarious watching right now. If you turn into like this giddy... Like, I actually don't know this version of you. You're kind of freaking me out. <laughs> it's like, it was just 
seemed normal, but he's like, I think I need to say something because it's sort of there and, you know, I think we just, I think I need to say something. And I really want to say it first. And I'm going, is he going to say what I think he's going to say? Or, because you don't want to put, say, like, is he going to say anything loves me? He's going to say, let's go out for dinner. Like, you want to make sure that he's totally. saying totally. <laughs> Me too. Me yeah. too. Oh, yeah, cool. Mexican's cool. <laughs> Whatever. But... When he said it, I was just relieved because I was worried about what I was feeling. My heart was going fast all the time. All of a sudden, I'm on my phone every 10 seconds. What? Yep. How are you going, babe? What's happening? You know? And I was like, seriously, what is going on? So when he said it, and then I felt like I had then permission to then feel it and say it. Yeah. I felt so vulnerable, though. And then I'm like... How do I tell people that I'm in love? Like, do you send out a group text? Hey, I'm in love. Like, I just didn't know. But the best thing about Jake and I is, I think, you know, it's harder when you're older and you're bringing two worlds together and you sort of try and find your rhythm. But we're so solid in us two, and yeah. the world can pass us by, but we're just there together. Yeah. And it's that's been really good for both of us, I think, because we just feel like we've got this partnership. Totally. Yeah, and which I do. think is important. One of the things which you haven't told me, but one of our friends told me, is that when he's sleeping, you put your hand on him because yeah. you can't believe that he's real and he's there. Yeah, and that is like the best thing in the yeah. whole world. It is. But like he's come, this person's come. And it's oh, yours. I feel really lucky, and I just feel like yeah. Some nights I'm like just because I need to know this is real. I don't want to, I was like, I get scared sometimes that I'm going to wake up and this is all going to be a dream. And yeah. it's like, but because of the person he is, he never makes me feel that way. But it's the effects of what I've gone through that I have this fear. But with him, I don't feel like I'm going to lose him. Yeah. yeah. Um, primary school style, every woman we have on the couch, you bring, we get you to bring a show and tell. Yeah. What have you bought? I've brought this rose quartz and this is something that Jim Stein's actually left for me and it's all about um, love and like letting love into your life and having the courage and there was a little note that was left with it and so many times when I'm feeling a little bit uneasy I carry it around with me so my friends have noticed that sometimes in situations I've got that in my hand and it was actually um, used to be quite rough. So that shows you didn't last three years. Oh my years. god, it's so smooth. <laughs> <laughs> I've held on to that. So yeah, yeah, it's just a little, it's like a little security blanket and something that was really thoughtful that he did for me. Yeah. And did he give it to you before he passed? He left it for me on his bedside table. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That is so special. It's yeah. the smoothest quartz in the whole world. But it's worked. Yeah, you've it's rubbed, worked. You've rubbed a genie love into your life. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Thanks, Trisha. No worries.